Claire, first of all, congrats on your book. I thought it was really just like a tremendous story collection. I loved it on so many levels. And thanks, Amanda, and to BookWorks for hosting us tonight and for celebrating Claire's beautiful book. Uh, so I think we're going to start tonight. Um, Claire's going to read from one of the stories. And Claire, are you, are you going to, to uh, tell us about the story? Yeah, I'll set it okay, up a little great. bit. Um, okay, yeah, so the and story... I'll mute myself. <laughs> This story, this is the book, Site Fidelity, and the story is titled Sister Agnes Mary in the spring of 2012. Sister Agnes Mary is a 74-year-old Catholic nun, and her real-life sisters, Ruth and Mano, who are also in their 60s and 70s, uh, we, I'm going to read a section where they're in the church together, um, and they have just found out that the church is, has like approved uh, oil, a natural gas drill site on an empty lot behind the school playground. And we'll just start with their reaction. So this is from Sister Agnes Mary in the spring of 2012. We should call our senators, Mano says. Mano is their activist, member of the Sierra Club, avid reader of Rachel Carson and Edward Abbey. Make signs, pick at the corners. Ruth pokes sister in the ribs, then points toward the ceiling. What does your husband have to say? Ruth means God, of course. She likes to tease sister. It's lighthearted, this teasing. Ruth's love language. Sister shrugs. Man, a few words, she says. Mano and Ruth giggle. The silent treatment, Mano says, sounds like all three of my marriages. Maybe he thinks that after all these years, he shouldn't have to tell you what to do, Ruth says. Maybe he thinks you should just know. Well, I don't. It's maddening. Sister detangles the rosary beads from her fingers, wraps them loosely around her wrist instead. Her sisters are having fun. She tries to relax. Mano nods. That exact kind of maddening caused two of my three divorces. She can't divorce God, Ruth says. Her sisters look directly at her. Their dresses rustle. Their shifting weight makes the old kneelers settle and pop. You two, sister says, are really snagging my nits. This makes all three of them laugh, their departed mother's favorite way to chastise them. Sister returns to her knees into the rosary. She keeps the book of Revelation clear in her mind's eye. Mother Mary sprouting eagle's wings to escape the beast, riding the thermals above the solace desert. Mary stalwart, born by her solitary strength and faith, Mary rewarded. Sister wraps a scarf around her ears, bundles herself into a black woolen coat that hangs to her knees. It is two in the morning. She can see her breath in the near frost chill and the air soothes the constant arthritic ache in her joints like fire doused to smoldering embers. Above the rooftops of the ranch houses, sister can see the flare stacks of new gas wells burning. If she spins where she's standing, she can see five burning flares, but she knows that there are hundreds, maybe thousands in her county alone. They don't smell like anything unless she stands right underneath them. Close up, sister smells engine grease, animal offal, wet clay, the bowels of the earth and the chemicals that strip them wafting together after the burn. Above the actual flames, the fumes and the heat distort the view, a world scrambled into waves unrecognizable. Beyond that space, the chemicals are swallowed by the big sky atmosphere and become invisible, which makes it easy to forget that they are still there. She carries two gallons of bleach in a heavy canvas tote bag and the pain in her shoulders and neck begins to spread down into her forearms, her fingers and hands, and then even her heart and her belly radiate the ache. Tonight, sister will execute a plan she's been working out for days. She hopes it will bring her close again to God. She worries it might push him further away. She notes the absence of direct answer to her prayers, contemplates the obvious lack of instructive miracle. She's grateful for the internet, for the wealth of information available to even an aging nun, the ways the invisibility of age might shield and protect her, the ways it might be a veiled, sharp-edged gift. Floodlights illuminate the playground, the swing set, the spiral slide, the basketball hoop posts wrapped in foam to keep the children from harm should they run into them. Behind the playground, the proposed fracking site sits dark under starlight and gilded crescent moon. There are no fences or gates surrounding it. A single bulldozer sits lonely on the empty lot. She's a little afraid, but her backbone, sturdy and expansive, a tree trunk of mud and twigs, ice and granite has widened with new rings. 
The machine's cap opens just as the website said it would, and she pours both gallons of bleach into the oil reservoir. Sister doesn't know whether her efforts will ultimately change anything at all, but for this moment, her joints have stopped aching. When the pain returns, suddenly she closes her eyes. She imagines her doubt and her fear encapsulated by her pain. She imagines holding all of it in the palm of her hand, white hot, imagines placing it humbly on an altar. Please accept this offering, she prays. Turns out she can't, after all these years, give God the silent treatment. She believes that he has seen her, that he always sees her, even when he doesn't respond. Sister returns to the candle glow of the vestibule off the main sanctuary. She doesn't know whether to expect a blessing or a punishment. The silence sits still in the chapel air, breaks into particulates, clings like incense smoke. At dawn, there's a mini Mardi Gras moment when sunlight streams through the stained glass windows and lights the hard wooden pews with flecks of purple, gold, green. This beauty is neither miracle nor God's voice. Sister sees this beauty every day, like the sunrise, no matter how she behaves. And I'm gonna stop there, thank you. Oh, thank you, Claire, that was fantastic. Um, I, I loved it and it was so funny and it was great to hear it in your voice too, that was, that was wonderful. Oh, thank you. Uh, and I, and, I, yeah, and I, was, I was thinking about this story and how, you know, we have this incredibly fascinating character in your narrator. She's a woman in her 70s who obviously has this really um, strong and complicated relationship to her faith, but also has like a, you know, incredible sense of knowledge about the environment at the same time. And so there's so much tension there. And I was thinking about how the complexity in her character is something that I notice in all of the stories here. It's, it's one of the most layered and nuanced collections I've read in, in ages. And what I was so interesting to me about it is that it's a book where the external world is constantly pushing down on the internal lives of your characters. And yet there's, it's also the other way around, right? It's the idea that like your character's decisions have such a grave impact on the world. And so there's this tremendous tension that I think is happening both um, throughout like the larger scope of the stories, but also just like paragraph by paragraph. And I was wondering if you set out to, to give the book such a wide scope. I think, I didn't, I didn't really set out to give the book a wide scope. I was just, for a long time, I didn't know I was writing a short story collection. I was just writing short stories about different things that interested me. And it almost always is, you know, how um, nature and the way we treat nature and the structures of like the economy that we've built that affect nature are really impacting human lives. And I think that really comes from my time as a farmer, um, you know, we were vegetable farmers, small scale organic. So we grew just a hundreds of different varieties of things. We, we had a farmer's market booth and a community supported agriculture program. So we were trying to grow pretty much everything that we could grow. Um, and just the way nature and commerce interacted with that situation and the effect it had on us, I think is what drives so many of these stories, even though not that many of them are about farming, um, but just that relationship um, where the external forces of the world really do matter to human relationships. I think I, that was something I have always been fascinated by and really wanted to explore. And then once I realized there was sort of a theme to, to the stories, then it, I was better able to maybe pull it together into a collection. How, how many stories in were you when you realized that it was, that you could see the kind of the theme thrumming beneath the rest of the stories? Like, when did you know it was going to be a cohesive book? I mean, I was pretty far along because I wrote them. I mean, the, the collection has four stories about these sisters that are sort of connected throughout. And then there's three other stories that are sort of not part of this world really, but centered around a sugar mill where the characters are connected to each other. And then there's stories that don't connect at all. So I think it took a while, you know, I felt like I had some connected stories and like maybe that would be a collection and I would keep going with those families. Um, so I was, I mean, I, I think I had all the stories written before, except one that I wrote afterward, but that I, before I really realized it was thematically cohesive enough to try to pull together. 
Oh, that's really interesting. And I love the idea. Of, I love the way that some of the characters kind of come back in other stories and we can feel that overlap, but I get a sense like, okay, here are the, here are the questions and the things that, that the writer is so obsessed with. And this is what is really threading the collection together. And yeah, I just thought that was really amazing. Oh, that's good. I was really grateful to have um, the editing that I received from Jill and from, you know, other people at Norton. Just, I really didn't know what order these things should be in and how to structure, you know, once I even had the stories. So that was really helpful to have other people kind of weigh in on <laughs> how things should be put together. I, I don't think I really knew how to do that. And I learned so much through that process of editing of how to put a collection together and I think it just challenged some of the things I would have, like my instincts were not right. And it was nice to learn that really. <laughs> That's really interesting. Um, so for, for those of you watching, Claire and I have the same editor, Jill Violoski at Norton. And Jill also was like instrumental in helping me um, order my collection too. And I remember she gave me the best advice. I think about, I, I think about this all the time now. She said, I, I told her how I wanted to order my stories and I had it all planned out. And she said, Molly, you're right now you're thinking like a writer when it's time to think like a reader. Oh, and I just thought like, wow, that's, that's really brilliant. She's right. Like I'm thinking about um, point of view and structure and all these things that a writer hopes become invisible to the reader by the time that the stories are done. But I was still so mired in the, in the craft and, on, and, and all the technical stuff that I really wasn't thinking like a reader. So yeah, there's something so helpful about just kind of like handing the stack of stories to someone and saying like, like you, like, you know, really smart out person who's not, who wasn't writing these stories. Like, how do you see it? Yeah, I mean, I, it felt like such a gift. It really did to have like, you know, and and because Jill is so wonderful, it was just like it, you know, you can trust her. <laughs> it's just like really great to um, to have that guidance. So I was really, I mean, you know, I'm an, I'm a newer writer. Like this is my first book. I it it's all sort of a it was all a big surprise, honestly. <laughs> that it, you know, it went this far, and it was just it felt so helpful so yeah I've been grateful for it for sure yeah absolutely one of the things that that really struck me about this book and that felt really unique to me is that I like you know I was I cared about the characters it felt it, it's such an emotionally generous book it's so intimate and I feel like I really really felt like I knew and cared about all of all you know all of all of the women in your book like I felt like I really they were just they just became really important to me as people as I was reading and yet I also feel like you know as, as you mentioned you're tackling a lot of economic and environmental issues like you know alongside you know or, you know in, in every single in every possible way in the stories and that was something that really impressed me and I was wondering like how you how you approach these ideas in your fiction like in other words how do you make big you know environmental economic political issues feel personal and intimate I, I think it, they do feel personal and intimate to me as a human and so I think that helps I mean I'm the characters are not me and the situations are not always real to life but um but but these things really I mean they are obsessions of mine like I'm obsessed with water policy and the way irrigation has changed the Western United States and, and the conflicts of that system that are coming to a head even really this year already. Um, and just, uh, so I think that's helpful that it's just an obsession of mine. Um, putting it into fiction felt hard. I mean, it was really hard because I think and I don't know that I'm always entirely on the right side of the line because I think it can feel really sometimes like you run the risk of it feeling like an essay or like it's didactic, like I'm trying to, or like, you know, like an essay or like a persuasive speech, you know, like a, like a composition paper or something. Um, so I, I really did try to uh, put the characters in positions and I think for me, the key was always, what do these women do? Like, what are their jobs? How do they move in the world? And how have they chosen to, like, what have they chosen for their lives in terms of vocation? And not all of them have jobs in the story. I mean, most of them do, but some of them, you know, like Ruth is kind of figuring it out in the first stories. But I, to me, I found like once I could connect the choices the characters had made for themselves with the issues that someone in that field might be 
create facing or creating that really helped in terms of fictionalizing big issues. Um, so, you know, like, of course, sister has chose, you know, she's, she became a nun when she was young and that's kind of been, and I was with her, I was really interested in like, so she was kind of like a rule follower and, and didn't challenge the church for most of her life. And now what happens when she thinks that's really what God wants her to do? Like, how does someone shift that thinking? Um, but it really was in kind of throughout the stories what the women's work was made helped to build a story around it that I hope was emotional. That's interesting. And do you feel like figuring out their figuring that out helped you get into even more morally gray areas that would feel kind of like sticky and interesting to the reader? I think in some stories, definitely. Um, because I think the you know, I'm thinking about there's a story called Natural Resource Management where the main character, Leah, is a, um, she's like a city planner. <laughs> she plans use of natural spaces and parks. And so I do think that that someone in that position tends to think about the good of the community in a way that other people may be looking at, like from single issues or from really specific angles. She would have to balance all those things, but it's also such a huge responsibility and it would require compromising and maybe compromising of like, I can imagine there are moments where you compromise your own ethics and like what you really believe is better because you have so many interested parties. So I do think there's some drama in that. Um, but again, like, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, it's so easy to get bogged down in issues and, and fiction. That's not what I love about, I mean, I love when fiction can do both things, but what I really want to know is what the characters are doing and, and what their hearts are and why it matters to them. And so trying to focus there and have the climate and environment and economic pressures be part of the plot, but also part of like the background and the setting and really trying to focus on character. Absolutely, absolutely. And what I, one of the things that I thought was so impressive about the book is that we could just feel like um, those issues, they, you know, they, they weren't capital I issues, they were genuinely you know, informing and complicating every part of the characters' lives. And we could just feel them kind of like pushing down on all of the decisions and, and, and every way that they live their lives. And then the way that um, all the decisions that the characters make them kind of like, you know, prep, you know, push up against, you know, or like, you know, do, do, do so, so much change and damage to, to the world around them. So that was just so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, who, who, who are the writers who you think do this really well? I think, I mean, I was really influenced by, <clears throat> when I was writing the collection, I, re I was reading um, Nina McConaughey, who's a her short story collection is Cowboys and East Indians. And it's not, you know, it's not always dealing with like climate or irrigation, but it is dealing with like rural spaces in the West and cultural differences and, and how we welcome or, or don't welcome each other. And I, I thought that, I found that really influential. And I- I love those, I, think, I love those stories. They're so good. I think Tommy Orange, his book, There, There is really a powerful book about the modern West. And I would, I read that while toward the end of writing the collection and I just found it really, there's so much action. The characters like do so many things and it, you know, it has so much narrative and, and also so much depth that I, I really appreciated that. Um, and then once I finished the book, or this story collection, um, I read How Much of These Hills Are Gold by C. Pam Zhang. And I just think that maybe is just one of the best books I've ever read about the American West. And so they're not all dealing with the same issues in the West that like site fidelity would be, but I think they're, those are some really amazing storytellers. Like that's exactly who I want to have telling me those stories. And it, I, would, I would definitely point anyone in the direction of those writers. Oh, that's really interesting. And, and what about, you know, you were talking about, you know, all of, you know, you know, we, you have your backstory of, you know, being a farmer and now being a writer and you're talking about all of your characters jobs like how, how much research did you have to do did you have to do very much at all. I think I did a lot of research for many of the stories, 
I mean, I think I do as much research often for a short story as I do for an essay, which I think seems, it just seems important to me. Um, so a, a lot of the things in, a lot of just the pieces of these stories are real life things. In, in ledgers, for example, like the construction of the dams and the way they influenced and affected the Gunnison sage grouse and the threatened nature of that land and the dispute of, with ranchers, that's all real, you know, the characters aren't real, but that's all real, um, that's a real setting. And those are real dams and those are real lex, breeding lex that the birds are on. So that, I mean, there's a lot of research that went into a story like that. And I, I, I feel like a, a lot of the stories then required research about public lands and decision making and but I I'm so interested in those things anyway it's uh, and a lot of times I just would be reading I'm really very inspired by journalism even though the stories aren't like ripped from the headlines but um you know I'll, I'll read about a fish kill in a river and it'll just stick with me and then it like swishes around with whatever else I'm thinking about. I mean, that has to be the same. I guess I'm interested like with you to like, how do you take what you're interested in and make it a story? You know, <laughs> But for me, it just feels like this big bin and everything gets kind of sh shaken and then it, it kind of comes out and then needs a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, yeah. do you find yourself doing, you know, your stories are also, and actually, I should say your collection was really influential. Like I, the Un-Americans, like I, I love, I love that the stories. And so I'm, I'm, I don't know if you want to speak to like yours are also very political, really in their own way, and how you kind of find those lines. I mean, I really connected with what you were saying. I, I have this. I think that I just kind of, for myself as a reader, buck against you know that capital P political fiction because it feels like it's it's kind of like implying a moral like a moral certitude that actually doesn't feel true to me in, in fiction. Like I'm really, really interested in the gray areas. And that was one of the things that was so interesting to me about about your book. And so I feel like it's exactly what you said. It's you know, it's it's for me just like, you know, being in, you know, you know, reading a lot of nonfiction, being interested in the things that I'm writing about, um, probably wanting to read all of that nonfiction anyway, or we see these documentaries mm -hmm. on these topics anyway, and then not knowing where the stories are coming from except when I hear a voice and it's clearly only coming from the character so I've never every time I've told I've said like oh I think I really want to write a story about x and so I should go off and research x the story completely like 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 breaks like just falls over under the pressure of like you know theme and you know and content and it just doesn't work because it's not about character and so I really connected with what you were saying it really just seems to it just has to come from people and it also I love the idea of thinking about what you were saying about work and how like someone's job can induce can, can inform so much and it was something that I I was actually just talking with my students about this uh last term before we finished and I was like you guys give your characters jobs like if you just you know just like it, it just kind of forces them out in the world it gives them something that they care about or that they resist or that they resent whatever it is it just kind of like helps define a person in a really interesting way um so yeah I just, yeah Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, it's funny because I, I was just noticing that a lot of people were not giving their characters jobs. And I just thought this is a way just to kind of like propel things forward is to think about, to, is to think about work. Yeah, or if um, nothing else, just to clarify who someone is, like who do you exactly. know that doesn't have a job? You know? <laughs> exactly. And like how much of how much of who we are is wrapped up in the things we choose to do and the things we, or the things we have to do to make yeah, a living. Things you know? we're forced to do, absolutely. Yeah. I feel like the politics are always really heavy. And I feel like in my fiction, I'm always trying to be really careful of, like, you know, I think like when you're writing about activism, or at least when I'm writing about activism, it feels very easy to make the characters overly heroic. Um, you know, <laughs> like, and that's not, I don't think that's fantastic fiction. That's not the kind of fiction I, I want to write really because I, it almost just feels, yeah, I, I think that's a danger that I'm always kind of aware of and the balance of how much do I have to explain for the reader and how does that, you know, who is the character talking to when they're explaining something that the reader needs to understand that they might not know about 
water law or ditches or whatever. Um, that's always, I feel like that's tricky. And I'm always trying to figure out the balance of it. I think it's just try to make it like as concise as possible. Whereas in an essay, you maybe would explain a lot more and devote a lot more time to the ins and outs and the inner workings. In fiction, you kind of got to get to the meat of it, of an explanation of something really fast and make it plausible that the story would need it, that not just the reader would need it, but the story somehow needs that explanation also, which is also, I think, tricky. Yeah, that's so true. And that was something that I noticed in your book was the idea that everything, all of the information that I'm getting is stuff that like informs the character and the specific situation of the story. And so it's always kind of driving things forward rather than, rather than like, I often feel like in my, especially in my early drafts, like I just, I'm so, I get so obsessed with the research and I've gone down so many research rabbit holes that I have it all in. And then I have to think, well, what actually, like what actually informs and um, complicates my actual character, like my character in the story. And so I noticed in your stories, like it was just always kind of moving forward and it was just like helping me understand something so that we could get to the next part and understand the character in a really natural way. Yeah, the first drafts did not do that very effectively. <laughs> um, well, how but, long did the book take you? I mean, eight years. I didn't know it was a book. Um, I, I was writing on the farm, I was writing a blog and it was a lot of memoir, you know, it would be just like, this is what happened. It was like more for marketing. Mm -hmm. And then it really became more like a memoir, more like, this is what I think this means, or this is what I'm struggling with about this. Or, you know, like it, the blog became less appropriate as a marketing tool <laughs> and more like me practicing writing, I think. Um, but I just started to feel like I, the farm, we had to give it up. I mean, it just, it never made any sense economically. And we ended up being able to sell it, but it was like real dicey. Are we going to sell it before the bank takes it because we can't afford it? You know, so we had a softer landing. I've, I've always felt really lucky for how, but at, that was the point where I started thinking about some of the issues that I felt had led to that and the things that I was seeing around me and feeling like I didn't want to just write about myself. Um, but I, I didn't, I wasn't a writer, you know, I didn't, it's not how I saw myself. I hadn't written a short story since like freshman year of college. So I, I've told this story a few times. So, uh, but I went to the library and I bought five or not, I checked out five years worth of best American short stories and just read them. <laughs> then um, started, I wrote man camp, and I still kind of knew like I wasn't, I just didn't have the skills that I needed to tell. So that I went, I actually went, I got my MFA I, at 40. I just <laughs> went and got an MFA. And a lot of these stories were the assignments for those workshop classes. So, so yeah, it took a long time. Oh yeah, no, it took me 10 years, the first 10 years. And I kind of feel like I, I feel like a book should take that, to, to take that long. Yeah. 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 Yeah, actually it takes a really long time yeah I'm trying to write a novel now in a shorter yeah. time than that and it's not great <laughs> it feels like I need a lot more time with it yeah, with it. yeah. Mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. and just like time in between those drafts and just it takes me so many drafts to even figure out what something is so I just mm -hmm. yeah truly mm -hmm. truly yeah something I mean 20 pages or 15 pages feels so much more manageable and so yeah the, the shift has been weird you know yeah, <laughs> I'm still weird. making no, it it's so weird it's so yeah. hard. <laughs> um, but yeah. Well, something I was thinking about with your stories, though, and it makes sense now thinking about like the the time in your own life that was that um you know that was spanning during the writing of the stories is the is like the, the idea that you know so for so for people out there the stories um move, you know basically cover the time span of you know the 1970s to I would say like the post future like the the near future and. What feels really interesting to me about it is that it makes so much, like this time span makes so much sense to me because we can think about what we knew about the environment in the seventies versus what we know about the environment now um, versus what we will know about the environment soon. And also like, what are the things that we know about that we choose not to look at or we choose not to think about? And, and so all of that, I felt it, 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 it was so smart the way that you constructed it. And I was wondering like, was that a conscious way for you to construct it once you figured out that you were writing this book? I think it was a little bit like I went back a little bit. The The long timeline was originally um, just to tell the story of those three sisters 
over the course of like their lives. Um, and so I, I wanted to kind of show how those relationships shift and change and also how they stay the same over time. But once I kind of knew th what the collection was, it did become, I thought it did become a way to tell that longer story really of like my lifetime really like as I was born in 1975 so the collection starts in 1970 and just really look at all those years we knew that climate change was happening we knew that we were doing catastrophic things you know this was it was after silent spring it was out you know it was after all those things that really gave America I think an environmental awareness and also was not enough to, to change behavior in a meaningful way. Um, so I think things have felt certainly to me in the last 10, 15 years, a little more dire in terms of climate change and there's more awareness, but there's not necessarily more action. And I'm just, I'm like, I'm sad about that. I'm, you know, I'm heartbroken about that in real life. And I'm fascinated by it in terms of like writing and, and those stories, why are people looking away? And I often think it's because the pressures of life in America make it really hard to engage with everything we need to en engage with, you know, with climate when you're just trying to like get your kids to school and they hate it, you know, or whatever it is. So, um, so yeah, I wanted to kind of look at it over a long period of time. Yeah, that's really interesting. That makes a lot of sense. Is that something like that? You cannot answer this if you would, don't want to, but do you feel that you're going to be writing about being like, is, it, are these issues just going to like kind of carry over into the next project too, or are they? I mean, so far they are to a degree. I'm trying to write, I'm actually going back to trying to write more about farming in particular as a like site of environmental catastrophe and possibility. Um, and I'm still really interested. I mean, right, currently my current obsession, which I think is like definitely into the draft of the novel is the way like the consolidation of wealth and consolidation of resources complicates any efforts to, for meaningful conservation. I mean, there are like hedge funds now coming in to buy land in Colorado to get the water rights. No one's really sure what their motives are. Um, and while there's a law against speculation on water in Colorado, it's, if you own the land, it, there's no, there's no vehicle to stop this. There's no, you know, they're in compliance with the law. I don't know. I just have a lot of issues of like what it means that Bill Gates owns the most farmland of anyone in the United States and, and what that means for the future. Um, but, but again, these are early drafts. So all of that feels really heavy and the story is not yet developed enough to, to make it feel, I just don't think the balance isn't there quite yet. Um, but yeah, yeah I'm really concerned about the future and I don't necessarily think I want to continue to have hope. You know, I want all my work to be hopeful. I hope I want site fidelity to feel hopeful when people are done reading it and not bleak. And I want my novel to feel bleak. And I hope that we continue to live in a world where fiction about climate that doesn't feel bleak can be true. But, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that we continue to live in that world. I just want to live in that world. And so, yeah. That was a long answer totally, totally. and very unspecific because I'm afraid to talk about my novel. <laughs> no, it's really, no, it's really interesting. I mean, do, do you feel are there certain things like as as you know as, as you're doing as you're you know writing about these things that that matter to, to the world and also and also personally to you in with this novel? Do you feel are there like moments where you think, okay, I really want to write an essay about this, or I want to do some specific journalism about this, or do you feel that it just kind of keeps fiction keeps calling to you? I mean, fiction definitely keeps calling to me because I love, I love the way that fiction, you know, you can make anything happen in fiction. You can make anything happen. It doesn't have to have happened or even really be 
I mean, it has to be plausible within the world of the story, but that is a huge, like that's, that's barely any kind of guardrail at all, you know? Um, so I, I love that about fiction and I love that I can make my characters do things that, you know, chain, chain poor bleach into bulldoze, like things that I wouldn't do or that I don't know people who have done, although people have done that. Um, but I also often feel like I want to write essays and I do sometimes write nonfiction about, you know, some, some real stories are just really compelling and they're more compelling in real life than they are in, in fiction, or at least as compelling in real life as they are in fiction. And that's often the, pe again, I think even in nonfiction, it's the people that are doing these incredible things over like the things that are happening themselves. But the, do you have, were there moments for you when you were writing Site Fidelity where like this urgency didn't come? Like where you thought, okay, I really wanna write this story and it just kind of lost its juice or you didn't know how, like, did you have to abandon any stories because these interesting things were not happening, even though, even though we can obviously do whatever we want with fiction. Yeah, I mean, I I really struggled to write. There is a story now in Sight Fidelity about um, Mano, where she's the main protagonist. Um, but I went through multiple versions of like what the who she was and what the background of that story would be. Um, so, like the specific example is that a real life thing that happened when I was small in Cleveland, Ohio, is that you, the United Way raised a bunch of money. You could like buy a balloon and it was like a dollar a balloon. And then they released helium balloons off the top of a really big building, a skyscraper in Cleveland. And uh, just the timing of it was so poor, just as they released them, a storm blew in off Lake Erie, pushed all those balloons down, onto the lake and like in onto the land surrounding Cleveland, um, like fishermen capsized in the storm and they couldn't find them because the balloons were on the surface of the water. So people drowned, uh, horses ate the balloons and, and died from the, I mean, it was just, it was an absolute catastrophe. And like, there's also, I mean, you almost hate to say it because it really was tragic, but there's also sort of a comic element to like this balloon launch that just went. So I was trying to like make that Mano story and it just couldn't, you know, there's something about the environment there. There's something about climate. There's, there's something in that story, but it just didn't work. Um, so yeah, that's not the story about Mano that's in the collection. <laughs> Um, so yeah, often, I think often, because I get really invested in these real life stories and then it's hard to let them go. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I truly understand that. Have you had that happen also where you're just like so obsessed with something and then it just can't fit into? Oh my, oh, so, I mean, so I, I can think of a few where I just like have these kind of like orphaned drafts on my desktop and I think, okay, well, maybe I can do something with them because the real story is so interesting and exactly what you said, like, oh, it would fit so nicely within the other stories that I've written and, it, you know, and, and I care so much about it. So why can I just, why just, but somehow it's like the urgency just isn't there. And that's when I can feel like, it can feel kind of like when I went with me, those stories become, feel really dusty and mechanical. And I just think like, okay, these, this is just not going to happen. And it's very, very painful, um, but it's just, it's just, it is what it is. Like I'd rather, I'd rather have, you know, have abandoned it than to have, than to cringe when I think about it being in a book. So yeah, yeah. right, absolutely. <laughs> right. Yeah, but it, it, it's similar to what you were saying. It's like having these, you know, these stories that feel, they, they feel like such incredible, like it feels like such an incredible story. But I think like, I, I just can't figure out how my characters and like my people kind of fit their, work their way into it. Yeah, you can't always map an emotion onto it that feels true to the real life story. I think that for me is always the struggle is to find the emotional internal struggle that feels resonant. And it just, when it doesn't work, it's terrible. <laughs> a lot of shame. I just, I just feel this tremendous shame. Yes. Yeah. 